welcome back. This is Melinda Cusera, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, there's no interview, um, unless I interview myself, but that would be kind of awkward. But some characters definitely have suggested that. I told them no. They said they could auto-generate their questions, you know, using a uh, digital voice. I said, no, that's not a good idea. So today, I'm going to read some of the next Curse Breaker book, which is Shards for His Gift. That's actually going to be book number 10 in the series. Um, if you're looking at the series page, you might be like, wait a minute, there's already a book 10. And that's because the book Spell of Shadows and Light is actually a prequel. But if you read it before Curse Breaker Hidden, you'll know more than Sarn does. So it's actually better to read that book after it. So since it does, it's a standalone involving all the same characters who are in Curse Breaker Hidden, it, the character's argued that I should put it as the seventh book in the series. I let them. Now they're saying they want a sequel, so that may be coming out of there and becoming its own series at some point. They haven't told me what we're going to be doing in this mysterious sequel, so I've not written any of it yet. If they ever come to me with an idea, then we'll talk. But for now, yeah, it's on there. But technically, Shards for His Gift will be the 10th Cursebreaker book. It'll be the sequel to Cursebreaker Revealed, and before I get into it, again, I'm Melinda Cusera. I'm an indie fantasy author. I've been publishing since 2016. And I have, well, Curse Bra um, Shards for His Gift is actually going to be my 21st book that I am publishing. So I'm kind of excited about it. I just hit publish on it last weekend. So let's talk about it. What is Shards for His Gift about? All right. So at the end of Curse Breaker Revealed, Sarn was wounded pretty badly. And... Some of the people that he was hiding his son from found out the little boy exists. And this obviously delighted Rand because he's been asking for I don't even know how many books to meet the people that his father works with. And he finally got the opportunity. So he was happy about that, but not about the way that came about. So in Shards for His Gift, Sarn is trying to recuperate. Rand is obviously bored out of his little mind and looking for an adventure. Sarn would like him not to find an adventure so that he can get well. Neither one of them gets their wish. So... I'll just read you the blurb real quick. While Sarn recuperates from his wounds and deals with his sentient magic, a strange gift arrives without any information about who sent it or why. Only a handful of people know where he's staying now, and none would send him a gift. For his son, this present is a mystery that must be solved. If he could just get his hands on it. But everyone conspires to keep it away from him until the command of the rangers goes in search of the dragons under the mountain then everyone suddenly has larger problems than where the mysterious crystal came from. Rand gets more than he bargained for when the gift does a lot more than glow. Once more, Sarn must rise from his sickbed and save his son, this time from the clutches of a magical crystal. And the story is a bit cozier. It takes place in the apartment where they are staying. So let's get into that right now. So here's chapter one of Shards for His Gift by Melinda Cusera, book 10 in the Curse Breaker series. Knock, knock. Ran opened the door, but the hallway was empty. Aside from the statues frozen in fight sequences scattered about, they glared at him with glowing crystal eyes, but Ran ignored them because they did that every day. Pairs of halo-wearing statues flanked the door too, but they weren't fighting or staring at him. Those statues just looked at each other, but they didn't knock on the door. Statues couldn't do that. So who knocked? Ran glanced around again in case he missed something. Bluish light shone down on him from the Lumiere crystal mosaic on the ceiling high overhead as movement caught his eye. Either a shadow flitted around the bend or he just glimpsed the mysterious knocker. Even if the knocker ran, could they reach the bend in the hallway without him seeing them? The shadow was small, so it might just be a cat running away when it heard him open the door. A cat, a cat could have run behind the statues and you wouldn't have seen it. Where did the knocker go? Ran glanced around the woman's statue cradling a male statue that would have slid off her lap if he wasn't made of stone. Another statue answered him. Neither statue answered him. Rand listened, but he just heard a faint echo of footsteps in the main transept. I could go to the bend and look, but that meant leaving Inari and Nolo's flat, and he wasn't supposed to do that without Papa or Uncle Myron. I won't do it. Papa got hurt really bad the last time I went out without permission. It was my fault Papa got hurt. Rand gripped the door. It was an inch thick and made of the same stuff as Nolthir's door, but it wasn't wood. Uncle Myron said all the wooden shiari was enchanted, and that was why the door wasn't made of wood. No one ever said what the door was made of, but it was hard like wood and striated too. Maybe the door was made of stone? What are you doing? Nerul asked from behind him. 
he was Inari Anolo's son, and he was a bunch of years older than Ran and a bunch of years younger than Uncle Myron, but he seemed like a nice boy. I heard someone knock at the door, so I went to see who it was, but there was no one out here when I opened the door. Ran swung the door wide open to show him. See? Narul looked more like his dark-skinned father than his mother, but he was more talkative than his dad. Nolo brooded a lot, but he had an important job, according to Uncle Myron. Inari was always sunny, and some of that sunniness had rubbed off on her son because he was smiling. Why was he smiling? I see. What's that on the door, Matt? Narul pointed. Ran spun and stared. There was a shiny blue box on the mat. That wasn't there when I opened the door. A ribbon wrapped around the box, and someone tied it in a big bow that tickled his fingers when he reached to pick up the gift. I never saw a box like that before. The box shimmered in the Lemire crystal light like it was a crystal. But it would be cold and hard if it was, and the box wasn't like that. It must be for your family. That was the only logical That was only logical since Nerul's parents owned the apartment. Who was it for? It's probably not for me. Only a few people know I live here. None had visited, but Rand hoped Furball would since Nothair's flat was just on the other side of this floor. But Furball might be grounded after their little adventure went awry a few days ago. We were just looking for Savine so we could meet his mom and find out what happened to the baby dragon. Rand hung his head. He still couldn't believe an adult dragon lived somewhere under the mountain, but his friend was a baby dragon, so his mom couldn't be anything else because that wouldn't make sense. Besides, Shiari was a magical country. If it could have mages, then why not dragons too? I still want to meet her. But Rand shuddered at the thought of descending to lower quarters again. That's where everything had gone wrong three days ago. Who's the gift for? Nerul rounded the couch, but he left his door ajar. The mysterious gift was interesting, was more interesting than finding out what was in his room, so Rand stayed in the doorway, unsure about what to do now. I don't know. I don't know how to read yet. Rand pointed to the card tucked under the bow. Can you read it? Rand hoped so, because otherwise, he'd have to disturb Uncle Myron, and he didn't want to do that. His brave uncle needed to rest and stop worrying about Papa. I'll worry about him since he got hurt safe to save me. I'll worry about him since he got hurt to save me. Rand glanced at the door across from Uncle Myron's, and worry weighed, weighed him down. The door was also ajar because he didn't close it when he raced to the front door. Through that gap, light fell, but it wasn't green because Papa must sleep or his wounds wouldn't heal. So that light came from the window or a Lumiere crystal since Papa hated darkness. Yes, I go to school like your uncle. Let me see it. Nerul took the gift from his nerveless hands before it could fall and studied the card. It's for you. Rand opened his mouth, but no words came out. For a moment, he knew how Papa felt when words failed him. Who sent me a gift? Does it say on the card? Because the only people who gave him things were in this flat, so they couldn't have left it on the doorstep. Besides, it wouldn't make sense for them to leave a gift out there when they could just hand it to him. I only have two friends, Furball and Savine, but they wouldn't leave a gift and run. They would have waited until I opened the door and at least said hello and maybe came in for a cup of milk and a cookie. Ran Inari always had cookies. Ran glanced at the kitchen, which lay beyond the couches in the living room, and the dining table and its chairs. I don't deserve a cookie. Not when Papa couldn't eat anything but gruel until, his, until the wounds in his stomach healed. Will you open it and see what's inside? Nerul held the box out. He was much taller than Ran, but that made sense since Nerul was like double his age or something. Yes, but it's a pretty package, so I must be careful. Ran hurried to the couch and left the apartment door open. Nerul closed it, then followed him. Do you want help with that? Sure. Ran plopped onto the couch. It was nice living in a place with furniture to sit on, and it had windows, too, that overlooked the meadow spreading from the rocky feet of Mount Eredrin. Their previous two homes, a damp cave in the lower quarters and Nothir's cramped apartment, didn't have much furniture. Nothir's flat had windows, but not as many as Inari's and Enolo's, Enolo's flat. Light shined in through the kitchen window and spotlit a napkin-covered plate. A pitcher of tea stood next to it, but Rand wasn't hungry. Not when he had a mystery on his hands. Another couch faced this one, but no one sat there now. A blanket covered the place where Papa bled through the red-stained gauze wrapped around his waist. Was that only three days ago? It felt like more time passed. A bad person stabbed him twice, Uncle Myron said the other day. But Rand wasn't supposed to know that, since he listened in when his uncle explained what happened to, Nar to Nolo and Inari. Then Papa was unconscious and couldn't explain anything. So that task fell to his brother. Papa's in big trouble because of me. Rand stared at the box on his lap as other things he'd overheard since coming here rattled around in his mind and heart. I wish I'd, I wish I'd known about the boy sooner. I'd have found him a good home. Nolo said just last night, but Inari stayed silent. 
Rand blinked when tears blurred the present sitting on his lap. It was taller and wider than his two hands side by side. I don't deserve this gift. Rand set it on the low table between the couches. Narul sat opposite him and leaned forward. Why not? You've only been here for a few days, but you were very good during that time. Not good enough. Rand hugged himself as tears slid down his cheeks. Worry, wrap worry wrapped hot hands around him and squeezed. What if Papa didn't get better? If I was better, then Papa wouldn't be hurt right now. That's not true. Those people were bad. They would have come after your father at another time. Uncle Myron opened the door on the other side of the living room. You were just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they took advantage of that. But it wasn't your fault. Do you really think so? Rand rubbed his eyes as Uncle Myron sat next to him. Yes, I do. You're the best little boy in the world. Uncle Myron put an arm around his shoulders and gathered him in for a hug. Rand leaned into his brave uncle. What about Papa? Will he? Rand broke off, unable to say the word. But he must know, even if the answer scared him. No, your father's a fighter. He'll get better. It just might take a while, since we don't know how much healing that ghost could do through the ranger's medic. But it didn't sound like Uncle Myron believed that. Nor did he smile. He wore the same serious expression as always, just minus the furrow in his brow, because he wasn't doing schoolwork right now. But he regarded Rand steadily with his warm brown eyes, and that dared him to hope his uncle was right. It was kind of far-fetched, though. Ghosts didn't usually possess people and use their bodies to heal other people. But the ghost man wouldn't have done that if Auntie Sovin didn't make a deal with him. I hope Auntie Sovin's okay. After all, she took the ghost with her when she left. She's fine. Uncle Myron squeezed him tight. How do you know that? Rand leaned into him. She can walk through walls. Trust me, she's fine. Uncle Myron rested his chin on his head, and he was probably right. Auntie Sovin was a tough lady, but she always seemed a bit lost. Don't take this the wrong way, but is your aunt an angel? I'm only asking because she had wings and a halo, and only angels have that. Narul held both hands up in surrender. Oh, right, he saw her because the healing and making a deal thing happened in this apartment, while Papa lay right where Narul sat. Rand blinked to clear his sight. Yes, she is. It's a long story how she got that way, but I'm member enough to tell you if you want, just not now. Rand wiped his eyes on his sleeve and felt a bit lighter since he let the sadness out. Papa always said it was a good idea to do that. Bottling things up just made you feel worse, or so he said, and he was always right. Rand glanced at the door to the room where Papa rested. What's this? Uncle Myron picked the gift off, off the table and studied it. It's a present, and Rule says it's for me, but it doesn't say who it's from. Rand no longer felt like opening it. He stared at the door he left partially ajar. Was Papa really healing like Uncle Myron said? Well, let's find out. So let's jump into chapter two. And that'll be the last chapter we read for this excerpt. So here's chapter two. It shouldn't bind me. Sarn couldn't see anything except darkness. Go away. I need to see. But there was no light of any color. Just darkness without end or shape. But there should be light. There aren't. Why aren't my eyes glowing? Papa, don't worry. I'm coming, Rand said, and his voice echoed. Where are you, son? Sarn scanned the darkness, but there was no sign of his son, nor did he hear the boy's footsteps, and Rand wasn't a quiet child, but the boy didn't reply either. Doesn't he hear me? Sarn reached for his magic to banish this darkness, but it didn't come. Where is my magic? He would have stared at his hands in horror if he could see them. Wasn't his magic inside him? Yes, it was. He felt its presence like a covered flame within him. Why wasn't it responding? A flash of memory provided a clue and a question. Are you mad at me again? Sarn recalled talking to his magic a while ago. That was a recent event, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Why did I talk to my magic? When the answer came, he felt weak and would have collapsed if he was standing. But he didn't think he was because he couldn't feel the ground under his feet, and he always felt its presence, even when wearing boots and thick socks. Am I lying down? Why would I be? As Sarn cast about for a reason, a dull ache in his belly and back throbbed, and he felt again the sharp bite of the blade stabbing him. Missing once was an accident. I should have stopped the second stab, but he didn't. I was tired, and my magic was too. Where are you, magic? Why won't you answer me? A green light kindled in the dark, and the light divided into a roughly man-shaped cloud shining in the dark, but it didn't shed any light on his surroundings. Why didn't you come when I called? Sarn couldn't tell if his magic stood across from him or floated above him. Everything was so topsy-turvy. Or maybe it's just me. My head's spinning. Why couldn't we fight him? His magic leaned forward as two brighter spots appeared in his face. And they stared at him like a pair of pupilless eyes. You're talking about Hadrival. Sarn closed his eyes. He didn't want to see that man's face or remember his return. He's gone now. We never need to deal with him again. 
That was all thanks to his sister, Sovin. I owe her for that. Yes, him. Why couldn't we resist him? He controlled us, and we didn't like it. We want to know why. His magic sat beside him, illuminating a bed, but nothing more. Fear choked Sarn, and he couldn't breathe for a moment. I can't black out. I must get a grip on the fear and get out of here. When the constriction eased, he reached for his head map, but nothing happened. His magic just sat there, waiting for an answer. Am I in the infirmary? Answer me! That place isn't safe for us. Sarn tried to sit up, but a glowing green arm shot out and stopped him. No, you're not in that place. Then where are we? Sarn glanced around, but his magic still didn't light anything more than the bed and him lying there. Somewhere safe. His magic waved away that concern. Why couldn't we resist him? We belong to you, not him. He shouldn't have any power over us. Why did he have that? His magic leaned forward until they were almost nose to nose. You couldn't disobey him because I couldn't. Sarn dropped his magic's fiery green eyes. Why couldn't we? Answer us. His magic banged his fist on the bed, but the mountain didn't shake. Sarn covered his magic's glowing fist, blotting out some of its light. Because I made a promise. I didn't want to, but I had no choice. I wanted my brother to go to school, and that was the price. No, you promised another man, not that monster. We hate him. His magic shook its glowing green head. Either Sarn was imagining it, or the glowing man sitting at his bedside was starting to look and sound like him. I must be imagining that. He rubbed his eyes. Yes, that's true, but I also promised to obey anyone that man told me to obey. Yes, we know this. We've been with you for many years. We were there when you promised that, but it shouldn't bind us. Why did it? His magic shot across the room and reformed by a window. Where under Mount Arendrin was there a window? It must be one of the above ground levels. If only he could rise and go to that window. The view should tell him where he was since his magic wouldn't. It wasn't normally this stingy with information. Why was it acting like this? Why did that promise force us to obey him? His magic slammed a green fist into the windowsill and it flexed. But it didn't crumble because it was stone and his magic loved stonework too much to harm it just to make a point. I don't know. Sarn rolled onto his side and stopped when that movement pulled on his healing wounds. But you have a guess? I know you do. His magic gazed out the window, but it still wouldn't let any of its light extend beyond that window. I have another type of magic. Sarn glanced away. He didn't want that other magic, but he was stuck with it. You only need me. You don't need it. That's true, but I still have it. For all the good it had done him, Sarn closed his eyes and tried to ignore the throbbing in his back and belly. He hoped the pain was a sign the wounds were healing, but he couldn't confirm that because neither magic he had access to could heal anything. So far, that white magic was more trouble than it was worth. His earth magic was far more useful, even though it had a mind of its own. I wish it couldn't bind you, but I don't think I can stop it. And that was the worst part of all this. That white magic had more power over him than he had over it, and no wishing that were otherwise would change it. Sarn sighed because there wasn't anything else he could do right now. It works on promises, yes? His earth magic shot across the room and reappeared at his bedside. From what I understand, yes. But I don't know if it's limited to that. Sarn felt impelled to point out. So much of that white magic was a mystery because it only came when it wanted to, rarely ever when he called it, unlike his earth magic. Promise it will never bind me. Promise me, and that should fix it. No! A white light gathered at the other end of the room. Oh, great, now his other magic wanted to chat. Sarn groaned. Yes, I won't do your bidding. His earth magic shot across the room and appeared near the cloud of white magic, but it retained its human shape. His white magic stayed a shimmering cloud. You must. You're part of something bigger. Well, I just am. The white cloud expanded like it was spreading its arms to encompass something larger than itself. His earth magic raked the white cloud with a glare. Well, you can't have him. He belongs to me. We are an earth mage, not whatever you are. The glowing green man gestured to Sarn. This must be why none of the old tales talk about mages having access to more than one power. All they do is fight. Sarn would have shaken his head if he wasn't lying down with a soft pillow under his head. Darkness eclipsed the room as the green light winked out. But we don't fight, his earth magic said in his mind as it settled over him like a warm blanket. You and I are one and we protect everyone. Yes, we do. Sarn opened his eyes and that familiar green glow wreathed his sight as it illuminated the bedside table laden with a pitcher, a glass, and covered dishes. There was a closet, a writing table, and a padded chair like the ones in the library in the corner by a small table with a book on it. But something else caught his gaze. Above a dresser, a mirror hung on the wall, and it reflected the glow of his eyes back at him. Where am I? 
Who had enough money to buy a real mirror? He felt the silver coating the glass from across the room. It called to him. What do I look like now? It had been years since he dared to look upon his face. What must I look like after so many trials and tribulations? Were his scars still vis visible? Partisan didn't want to know, but the rest was curious. He'd seen Rand's face countless times and wondered about his own. Everyone said they looked startlingly alike, and I don't look like my mother. Neither did Sovin, though. But she was his twin sister, so she should look like him. Sarn almost laughed at himself for framing it that way when she was the elder of the two of them, and she liked to remind him about that at every opportunity. But he sobered as the mirror beckoned to him. If I look in that mirror, will I see myself or the face of the father I never knew? Running footsteps, running footsteps startled him out of his thoughts. Sarn put the question aside. His body felt heavy, though some of the dizziness faded when his magic stopped interrogating him. Perhaps he'd just lie here since he didn't have the energy to rise. He could look in the mirror later if he dared or not at all. I don't have to look. I've had this face for 20 years and only a vague idea of what I look like. Sarn rolled slowly and painfully onto his other side to face the door as it swung wide open and a small shadow rushed in. So we're going to leave Sarn right now. And we're going to leave Shards for a gift right now. So that was a preview that you heard of Shards for His Gift. It's now available in all stores. I just published it last week and the last of the links just straggled in. There is no audiobook yet for it except for one that is narrated by the digital voices that Google offers. Um, I would love for it to have an audiobook narrated by a human, but um, I'll get there eventually. It's It'll just take some time. So I hope you'll check it out. I'll have all the links in the description along with the, the blurb. And yeah, I hope you've enjoyed listening to an excerpt of Shards for His Gift, book 10 in the Curse Breaker series. And it will be followed by Chasing Dragons. That will be book 11. And we will finally resolve the Dragon Jerlo thing that's been going on for four books now. So that's something exciting to look forward to wherever you are. Um, I hope you have a great day or evening. And again, I am Linda Casera, your indie fantasy author, and you've been listening to an excerpt from Shards from Skith. Have a good one.